All right, our next talk will be by Dr. Karen Edelblum from the Rutgers New Jersey Medical School, and her talk is going to be on immune interactions in the intestinal epithelium. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank the APS Education Committee for inviting me to come and speak. Um, you have to bear with me, I'm getting over a cold, so hopefully my voice is going to hold out throughout the rest of this. Um, so I have the pleasure of kind of wrapping up a lot of the things and I'm kind of pulling the thread together for a lot of the ideas that were talked about today. Um, my colleagues that spoke before me did a great job of doing a lot of the introduction, so hopefully I'll be able to kind of gloss through a lot of that. Um, but I was trained as an epithelial cell biologist and I'm interested in inflammatory bowel disease. And so as I began to use models of experimental colitis, I became more interested in how the immune cells, which normally people kind of think of as in their own compartment, are interacting with the epithelium. And so this makes the intestine a perfect model to study these types of interactions because it's really the largest immune organ in the body. It contains about three quarters of all of the lymphocytes. And you can see here in this cross section, is this the pointer that doesn't work well? All right. You can see in the cross section on the left that you can see that you have these huge lymphoid aggregates that are the Peyer's patches. So these contain the germinal centers that are important for plasma cell differentiation. And then within the intestinal tissue itself, that you have more diffuse localization of immune cells. So you'll have immune cells that are located within the intestinal epithelium, as well as the cells that are located below the basement membrane or in the intestinal lamina propria. And the intest the having the immune system, um, as uh, Jessica described earlier, it's really important to have um, a robust immune system because you have a single layer of epithelial cells, and that's all that's serving to protect um, the body from all the contents of the intestinal lumen, which, as Dr. Collins did a great job um, talking about how there's a distinct microbiome within the gut, in addition to dietary antigens and pathogens. So we know that there's about a thousand different species of bacteria, and he beautifully um, outlined all of the different factors that influence the microbiome from the maternal contribution to the diet to host genetics, um, as well as what happens on factors that induce microbial um, uh, dysbiosis, such as um, antibiotic treatment or um, inflammation associated um, dysbiosis. And so what we know is that this is a very symbiotic relationship um, and that the depletion of the microbiome will adversely affect the development of mucosal immunity. And because you have such a large surface area within the gut, um, it stands to reason that a physical barrier is going to require some form of active surveillance. And so a lot of times what we think about is we think of the epithelial cells as a particular barrier. We also tend to forget that they're also immune cells. So they can present antigen on MHC class 1 molecules. And then we generally think about the immune response. So what cytokines are being activated when you have bacterial invasion? How is that driving a pro-inflammatory response within the cells in the lamina propria? But the main purpose of mucosal immunity, which I'm only going to touch on, you know, a couple of topics today because there's a two-volume textbook. And when I teach medical students, I get one hour to try to distill all of GI mucosal immunity. Um, and so what I'm going to really focus on today is looking at um, the direct interactions between the immune and epithelial cells and provide kind of an update of what we've learned over the last 10 or 15 years, things that you may be able to supplement if you're teaching an epithelial biology section um, or if you um, are going to go into the more um, immune-based aspects. But when we think about mucosal immunology, what we're really looking at is how do you maintain a balance between promoting immunological tolerance to commensal bacteria, to dietary antigens, while also being able to be immediately prepared to respond to an invasive pathogen. And so to be able to kind of perform this surveillance and know, you know who, who needs to be there versus who doesn't, um, this requires antigen sampling. And there are multiple mechanisms by which myelase cells can uptake bacteria or other luminal antigens. And so I'm sure many of you are very familiar um, with microfold cells or M cells in the Peyer's patch. 
Um, and that's in addition to the ability of myeloid cells being able to sample luminal antigens throughout the rest of the, the GI tract. So I'm first going to talk um, about M cells and just give you a little of a refresher. So um, M cells are part of the follicle-associated epithelium that lines the, um, the Peyer's patch, which is a germinal center that consists mostly of B cells. So this is where plasma cells differentiate. They primarily produce secreted IgA. And these M cells are unique in the fact that they don't have a brush border. And so it makes it a very attractive place for microbes to be able to invade. And so they express um, a variety of different cell surface proteins, from glycoproteins to different integrins or other receptors um, for either commensal or pathogenic bacteria. And so the, the microbes can make their way to these receptors, particularly on these cells, because even though the receptors are expressed on the enterocytes nearby, having the brush border and a thicker mucus layer makes those regions less accessible. And so when the antigen will bind to the apical surface of the M cell, the M cell then takes out the antigen by endocytosis or phagocytosis. And then through um, vesicular transport, it dumps it out in the basolateral surface. But these M cells are unique in that they have a central hollow. So that allows antigen presenting cells, dendritic cells, or other cells to be able to more easily acquire um, these antigens. So that once the DC acquires the antigen, it can then be transported um, and activate T cells, which is shown here. I'm showing you, you have the M cell where the antigen is taken up, and then the DCs will, the dendritic cells um, that are either bound to a commensal or a pathogen. If it's a commensal, within the pyrus patch itself, it can induce um, B cell differentiation to promote IgA production. Alternatively, that T cell, that dendritic cell can also migrate through the upregulation of different chemokine receptors to the mesenteric lymph node. So this way it can then prime T cells, and in particular if it's recognizing commensal bacteria, it will then, um, in the context of immunological tolerance, then induce the um, formation of regulatory T cells. So there are two main myeloid cell types that are involved in antigen presentation. Because if you're going to think about, when you in the small intestine, you have pyrus patches, right? So it's an easily accessible place for bacteria to enter. But then you have the rest of the surface area of the gut. And it's like, are you never going to have any other place where a microbe is going to try to enter the epithelium? Like that doesn't really kind of make a whole lot of sense. And so what we've been thinking about is, well, how do antigen-presenting cells pick up cells actually within the intestinal mucosa? And so there are a couple of different um, uh, intestinal myeloid cells, and I don't want to get too immunologically heavy on you, um, but these cells, they derive from a common progenitor, and they are antigen-presenting cells, so they express MHC class 2, and they also express CD11C. So these are common between those two types. However, then they differentiate, and you'll have on the left side, you can see the cells that are more like macrophages. And these cells express a chemokine receptor, a fractalkine receptor, or CX3CR1. And these cells are very um, avidly phagocytic, and they're also involved in more regulatory processes, so they can upregulate IL-10 production. However, you also have cells that are more, that become dendritic cells. And these cells are characterized in part by expression of alpha E beta 7 integrin, or CD103. And these cells are, in fact, highly migratory. And so a lot of what we've learned over the last couple of years and how this field has rapidly expanded is because we have better characterization of what different cell types are in the lamina propria, as well as there's been a lot of technological advances that allow us to actually see what's happening in real time. And so using mouse models, intravital microscopy has actually played a huge role in our understanding of how all these different cells interact and how immune cells interact with epithelial cells and actually outlining the process by which antigen sampling or um, different immune cell interactions um, come into context. And so I'm showing you an example of that here is if you have um, a reporter mouse, 
for MHC class two. So it's pretty much all of those myeloid cells. What you can see is that you can see these projections that come out from the lamina propria, which is pretty much, you can see that in red. So these, these um, transepithelial dendrites extend through the junction of the epithelium out into the lumen. And when the arrows pop up, you can see they almost form these little balloon-like structures. So that allows them to expand their surface area to be able to capture as much antigen as possible. And so then further analysis showed that these are actually the CX3CR1 macrophages. So they're, ex they're extending these transepithelial dendrites, and you can probably see a lot of them pointed out, the little tiny skinny um, dendrites with the arrows. And you can see that they're extending out into the lumen, but they don't disrupt the barrier. And so a couple of groups have shown that it's possible that these, that these macrophages or dendritic cells are expressing junctional proteins so that they can slide through the tight junction without disrupting barrier function to extend the process sample, um, as you can see over there in L, sample into the lumen and then retract back um, to be able to go and present antigen. And it's been shown that these TEDs um, increase in response to bacterial infection, so in the context of an invasive um, bacterium such as Salmonella, as well as in response to bacterial ligand stimulation or activation of toll-like receptors. And I told you these CX3CR1 positive cells, they're great at phagocytosing things, but they're not very mobile. So what's the point if you're gonna go sample antigen or pick up a bacteria and then you're just gonna sit there? So these cells can actually be, for function as one part, is being able to sequester the microbe. So they can pull the microbe out before it can even get into the epithelium and then just hold it there so then it can't disseminate into the body. Alternatively, it could also function just to be able to present antigen locally within the lamina propria. But somehow you've got to figure out how to get all of this antigen that was just sampled to the migratory dendritic cell that can then go and induce T cell differentiation. And so one group, they had a bunch of fluorescently labeled antigen, and then they gavaged that in mice to infect it, and then did a, a time course to see which cells are gonna pick up the antigen. And what they find is it's mostly the CX3CR1 positive macrophages and not so much the CD103 positive dendritic cells. But then they went and cleverly looked using microscopy, and you can see in the green cells that are the macrophages and the white cells that are the dendritic cells that there are these gap junctions forming between the two cells so that you actually get an exchange of the cytoplasm from one cell to another. And so these gap junctions, which are shown by the arrows or they're shown in red in the bottom, that's actually allowing not a whole bacteria, but processed antigen to be trafficked from the macrophage to the dendritic cell. So if it was gonna pick up a whole bacteria, it's probably just gonna sequester. Um, the CX3CR1 positive macrophage will probably just sequester it. However, if it's processing the antigen, it's then gonna just kind of hand it off like a baton in a relay race and give it to the dendritic cell. And then the dendritic cell will then go um, if it's a commensal-derived antigen or something um, from that's that picked up during steady state, it's going to induce a tolerogenic response. So it's presenting these innocuous antigens to induce um, the, form, the differentiation of regulatory T cells or antigen-specific IgA. And this is how oral tolerance um, to dietary proteins is maintained. And also, it's also important because this is how this immune system knows not to attack um, the commensal microbiota. However, in the context of infection, this is also how we can appropriately amount um, um, an immune response because you're going to have a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokine production, you're going to have a lot of microbial products around that are going to um, induce a more inflammatory response. So another form of antigen sampling kind of comes from an unlikely place. So goblet cells, you're most you're probably very familiar that they will undergo primary exocytosis um, through a second messenger and they'll secrete mucin granules. However, recently um, Rodney Newberry's group at WashU showed that if you have binding of acetylcholine 
um, to the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor, that actually releases calcium and induces compound exocytosis, where there are holes that are now formed in the apical surface, which allow um, luminal antigens to be able to flood the cells. And then dendritic cells, the CD103, the same um, migratory cells, will then be able to go and sample these antigens. So again, these are time-lapse images from um, intravital microscopy. And what you can see on the left, so blue are all the nuclei. That's pretty much the epithelium that you're looking at. And red is a, a fluorescent dextrin in the intestinal lumen. And as it's being picked up, you can see it's being picked up um, in the one goblet cell, and the arrow points to where the green dendritic cell is kind of wrapped around the base of the goblet cell, and then it'll be able to pinch off, at least we think it pinches off, um, a soluble antigen. And so this is a um, time-lapse image where here you can see the dextran um, within the goblet cell, and then the goblet cell in green, you start seeing little red and yellow vesicles forming. So that's when it's actually taking up the antigen, um, and then um, it's able to then go migrate into the mesenteric lymph node and present that to T cells. What's interesting is whenever you think about this balance between tolerance and infection, in every, like in case of infection, you know the crafty bacteria are trying to figure out how can we use this to our advantage. And so they further went on to show that if they infect the mice with salmonella, that salmonella not only uses Peyer's patches to invade the intestine, but they can also use the gaps as kind of like a sneaky backdoor to be able to get in. But this happens very early in infection, and it's mostly required for them to be able to colonize um, and disseminate to the mesenteric lymph node. So it has no effect on like how many salmonella get through the Peyer's patch or how many end up in the circulation or in the spleen, but specifically trying to get to the mesenteric lymph node, they need these gaps. But paradoxically, what they also showed is on the, on the left side in an uninfected mouse, you can see all the arrow are pointing to all of the different gaps um, that are formed in the goblet cells. However, when you infect with salmonella now, you see all these gaps are shut down. But why would it do that? Because you have, it needs the, it's trying to use the gaps to get in, but then why is it shutting them down? Well, what we think is happening is that once you have enough salmonella get in, they're actually activating mucosal immunity so that you have myeloid cells that are making IL-1 beta, and it ends up being a negative feedback loop. So it's like, oh no, they're coming in through these gaps. We need to be able to turn that off so no more bacteria can get through. And so when you're trying to say, you know, looking at the context with throughout the intestine, well, which one of these responses is more predominant? And what we find is that in the small intestine, which has much lower level of commensal bacteria, like a lot lower level of commensal bacteria than the colon, is that we're finding that this is where you find the majority of the TEDs and the gaps. Um, and then if you give mice broad spectrum antibiotics, you can actually see now see these gaps form in the colon. So we're thinking that this means that the um, innate immune response um, to the commensal bacteria is actually inhibiting the formation of these gaps, which would make sense because you would want a lower possibility of bacteria to be able to use these gaps to penetrate the epithelial barrier. So just to rehash what I, what I explained about um, antigen sampling is the traditional um, thoughts of how um, bacteria get into the epithelium are through um, transcytosis across M cells, where then the dendritic cells can pick up antigen and present it. Um, and then you have gaps, so the goblet cell associated passages, as well as the transepithelial dendrites. At steady state, you have both of these uh, myeloid cells, and they're inducing the formation of regulatory T cells to induce tolerance. However, in the context of an invasive pathogen, you're seeing a differentiation of these T cells into Th1 or Th17 pro-inflammatory phenotypes, and then you're having activation of um, acute mucosal immune responses. So now if you think you have, all right, so you have a couple of sampling events happening here and there. 
um, within your intestinal villi. But you're really only hitting, I don't know, maybe like one, one spot, like maybe every 20 or 30 cells. Like how effective is that really as a form of epithelial surveillance? And so this is where another cell type comes into play. And these are intraepithelial lymphocytes, which are a specialized subset of T cells. Um, they're actually very similar to tissue resident memory cells, except that they're located within the epithelium. So you can find them either along the basement membrane or between adjacent epithelial cells in what we term the lateral intracellular space. And these cells are unique in that they actually kind of form the intersection between innate and adaptive immune responses. So they're T cells, they have a T cell receptor, they still induce all of those signaling pathways. However, a lot of the times they don't actually need a TCR stimulated signal to induce their effector function. I'll talk about that in a moment. But within um, humans as well as mice, you have a variety of different populations, predominantly because they're tissue-associated resident memory cells. Um, they're CD8 positive, however, there are some that also express CD4. And they're pretty much split between those that express conventional alpha beta T cell receptor and those that express the gamma delta T cell receptor. And you can see um, in the scanning um, EM that is on the bottom that these IELs that are in yellow are in close association um, with the epithelial cells. And that there's about one IEL for every five or ten um, enterocytes. And so traditionally when we believe um, what IELs have been characterized as doing is that they have a very high cytolytic capacity. And so of the two main subtypes of IELs, you have those that are induced. So those that are induced kind of like any other T cell where they need to have an antigen presented to them. They are now antigen dependent. They're going to have a specific response. So in the top panel, say you have a virally infected cell and then your enterocyte is going to process the virus and display it on MHC class one. So then of course your T cell recognizes that's my antigen and binds to um, MHC class one and then will induce cytolysis either through a fast dependent mechanism or through secretion of perforin and granzymes which will effectively lyse the cell. However, there are also natural IELs that are antigen independent. And so this is in the case of celiac disease, um, as is a, is a great example, where you have gliadin um, will then become internalized into the cell, and that induces a stress response. And so the stress response in, in uh, humans, you get mic A and B expressed on the um, basolateral surface, and as well as an increase in the production of IL-15. And IL-15 will upregulate um, NK-like receptors, such as NKG2D, and these recognize those stress receptors on the epithelial cell and then target that cell for cytolysis. So until recently, you know, in the last 10 years, we're pretty dependent upon, you know, thinking that IELs are mostly inducing cytolysis because they're generally hard to get to. Um, they're hard to keep alive. And so it was really a, a difficult model system to really be able to understand their function. Um, and so this is actually work from my laboratory in which we were interested in trying to understand how immune cells and epithelial cells um, interact and if that could give us a better clue as to their function. And so these are mice that have a GFP, um, gamma delta T cells. Again, the blue is, um, are all the nuclei. You can see it's kind of forming, it's an orthogonal section, so it's formed the ring of the epithelium, and the red is the luminal dye. And what you can see is that these cells are highly dynamic and migratory within the gut. So they're, they're actually turning into an active surveillance mechanism or providing like a border patrol so that over the course of um, relatively few minutes, they're able to interact with majority of the villous epithelial cells. And not only are they patrolling along the basement membrane, but they also migrate up into the lateral intracellular space between epithelial cells. And you can see kind of just how extensive those interactions are. So on the left, I'm showing you just a single time point where you have a couple of gamma delta ILs within the epithelium. And then if you take one of those videos and superimpose all of the images on top of each other, you see that over the course of an hour, 
pretty much every epithelial cell will come into contact with an IEL. So it's actually um, one epithelial cell will see three to four IELs over the context of an hour. But how is this changed in the context of infection? Um, so in this experiment, we looked um, and had fluorescently tagged invasive Salmonella typhimurium, which you can see on the right side is the light blue. And what you see is on the left, the ILs are migrating around, kind of performing their normal surveillance behavior. But on the right, they go from surveillance more into like bloodhounds. They can somehow figure out where the bacteria is or where those bacteria infected cells are and directly be able to target them. And we found that not only do more IELs migrate into the epithelium, but they stay there longer. And if you inhibit their migratory behavior, that you can induce the translocation of the bacteria as early as within 30 minutes after infection. So these are really like the sentinels. This is the very first immune cell that's going to be able to respond in the context of infection. So we know that they respond to pathogens, but what is their effect in response to the microbiota? And so Damusita's group at Rockefeller has shown that um, looking in, now you're very familiar with the concept of germ-free mice, um, so that if you're looking in specific pathogen-free or basically normally colonized mice, um, the white lines are showing you kind of the extent of the coverage that these ILs are able to migrate. And in germ-free mice, that's significantly reduced. However, if you recolonize them, um, then you can see that the migration is restored. Um, and they went on to show that it's actually their pathogen recognition receptors or the TLR signaling on the epithelial cells that are required for this motility in response to infection, implying that the bacteria is inducing innate immune receptor activation on the epithelium, which then provides a second signal to activate the T cells. Um, and other groups have shown that similarly that you need these same crosstalk pathways so that gamma delta ILs can make antimicrobial peptides. So this is a brief summary of everything that we really understand how, what IELs do. Um, so on the top you can see that they are able to induce the cytolysis of infected or stressed epithelial cells. Um, gamma delta ILs have also been shown to regulate goblet cell number. Um, as well as their mucin production and the glycosylation of those mucins. So it's possible that indirectly they're also helping to form gaps because if you don't have enough goblet cells, it's going to be a reduced number of these um, goblet cell associated passages um, for luminal sampling. Um, we've shown that they provide this active immune surveillance and we think that their migratory behavior is actually allowing them to provide a more localized effector response. So they have to be able to figure out where exactly the bacteria are so that they can go and locally secrete antimicrobial peptides or potentially other cytokines and chemokines to recruit other um, immune cells to be able to either repair the epithelium or um, phagocytose bacteria. And then they also contribute to antimicrobial peptide production so they can produce it directly themselves or alternatively they can um, indirectly induce the production of um, antimicrobial peptides in PANA cells because they produce IL-22. And that many of these interactions, um, we believe, are dependent on IEL epithelial crosstalk, but we're really only now beginning to understand what those signaling pathways are. So the last cell type I wanted to tell you about is, is kind of the new hot cell type um, in immunology. And these are innate lymphoid cells. So innate lymphoid cells, unlike T cells, they don't have a recombined antigen specific receptor. Actually the way you identify them is they're the cells that express none of the other markers that any of the other cells do. So you kind of, you stain them for everything and the ones that stain for nothing are in fact the ILCs. But we know we call them innate lymphoid cells because they have a lymphoid morphology. And these cells are selectively enriched at mucosal barrier sites. And so when you're thinking about ILCs, they actually correspond pretty well to how T cells differentiate. So we know that Th1 helper cells make a lot of interferon gamma. So do ILC1s, 
we know that um, TH, uh, T helper cell um, type 2, that they make IL-5, IL-13, so do IL-C2s. TH17 cells make IL-17. It would be really handy if they called them ILC-17s, but no. They call them ILC-3s, but they also make IL-17 and IL-22. And what we know is that, um, kind of like a lot of things in um, mucosal immunology, when you have dysregulation of the system, when you're going to favor pro-inflammatory um, T cell differentiation or any kind of cell differentiation, and you have a reduction in regulatory cells, that's when you see disease pathology. And that's what we see um, in the case of um, Crohn's disease, where now we have an increase in the number of pro-inflammatory ILC1s and a reduction in the number of protective phenotype ILC3s. And so this slide will just briefly summarize a lot of the things that ILC3s are doing in the gut. So these cells respond to IL-23, that's made by dendritic cells, and then they produce IL-22. And the majority of the cells that have the receptor for IL-22 are in fact the epithelial cells. And so this IL-22 can induce antimicrobial peptide production by PANA cells, as well as induce the production of mucins by goblet cells. Further activation of IL-22 receptor within enterocytes can induce um, STAT protein phosphorylation and the production of IL-10, which is an important cytokine for regulatory T cell development. It can also um, induce epithelial expression of chemokines that are involved in neutrophil recruitment. And then along with what we were, um, what Dr. Collins was talking about, it can also regulate um, the microbiota by inducing glycosylation on the epithelium. So if you have fucosylation, this will actually can provide kind of a food source for microbiota, and it also inhibits the ability of pathogens to invade. And so a lot of what I've talked about today are how um, just within the epithelium as well as within the immune cells, um, how where everything is kind of mutually dependent between um, the commensal bacteria and um, the host. And so I think Dr. Collins briefly touched on this, that various commensal bacteria actually drive the differentiation of various mucosal um, lymphocyte populations. So segmented filamentous bacteria and some lactobacilli. They induce various proteins such as serum amyloid A, um, that can induce IgA production, as well as polarization of IL-17 producing cells. Um, various clostridia species produce, um, help break down um, dietary fibers and the production of butyrate to induce regulatory T cell um, differentiation. And then a variety of different bacteria will produce various um, toll-like receptor ligands or nod ligands that are involved in the generation of innate lymphoid cells or mediate cytokine production by the epithelium. But while we know that these whole bacteria can have specific effects, what we're starting to really appreciate more is that the metabolites of these of various bacteria are also contributing to the development of the immune system. And this is really shown with the importance of aryl hydrocarbons. And so a lot of the aryl hydrocarbons, so you have ones that are endogenous, so like tryptophan, as well as ones that are diet-derived, that come from flavonoids, carotenoids, um, or the breakdown of cruciferous vegetables. And so when you eat a lot of broccoli, your microbiota will then break down um, these ligands through their metabolic activity. And then as a result, you get activation of the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. And this just shows you how, what a large impact that one receptor has on mucosal immune development. So starting on the top left, you can see that it induces ILC3 development, which I just told you about how important the production of IL-22 is to maintenance of mucosal homeostasis. If we go clockwise, you can see that it can induce differentiation of naive T cells um, and, this, and facilitate differentiation of Tregs, Th1, Th17 T cells. Um, as you're looking at 3 o'clock, um, with the gamma delta T cells, they're important for their development. If you have aryl hydrocarbon receptor deficient mice, you won't have the development of gamma delta T cells, so now you lose that ab ab ability to survey the epithelium. <clears throat> 
Um, it's also important for inducing um, B cell homeostatic proliferation. So it's not only the whole bacteria, but a lot of the meta metabolic processes that we're beginning to understand, that these all kind of feed into a larger picture of how the mucosal immune system not only develops, but also functionally regulates homeostasis. So just to kind of briefly summarize, um, I've shown, I've described that CX3CR1 macrophages, they form these uh, transepithelial dendrites for luminal sampling. Um, and then they can either sequester the bacteria or pass it off to um, CD103 positive dendritic cells, um, which can either pick up antigens from the macrophages or alternatively sample contents um, from the um, goblet cells. I've shown you that intraepithelial lymphocytes are capable of inducing epithelial cytolysis as well as providing a kind of a unique form of immune surveillance to limit microbial invasion. And then the relatively newly described um, innate lymphoid cells, um, the, some are more pro-inflammatory, ILC1s in the context of inflammatory bowel disease, but ILC3s are actually promoting host defense and maintaining symbiosis through the production of IL-22. And so to summarize, um, really intestinal homeostasis, as, as you would know, requires a balance between maintaining tolerance to commensals as well as mounting an appropriate response um, to um, antigens. And really, we're now only beginning to really appreciate the rapidly expanding mechanisms by which commensals are able to regulate epithelial and immune homeostasis, as well as when um, you have host genetic factors. So if you can't recognize bacteria and uh, respond appropriately, so like in cases like inflammatory bowel disease, how that induces dysbiosis. If you have a, a change or you have blooms in specific bacterial um, uh, phyla, then you end up um, kind of just perpetuating the cycle of disease. And also now that we have more tools and we have a better understanding of all of the immune pop mucosal immune populations, um, now we're seeing kind of a renewed interest in how immune cells and epithelial cells directly interact and how we can facilitate those interactions, which of those might be beneficial. And this might be able to provide new therapeutic targets um, for disease development, uh, for therapeutic development, sorry. Um, and so if you have any additional questions, I would be happy to take them, or you're also welcome to contact me once you process all the